Microsoft Bob Microsoft Bob launched in 1995 with confidence that only Microsoft could afford. It wasn't pitched as software, it was pitched as the future of computing for everyone. Instead of boring windows and menus, Bob gave you a cartoon house. Your email lived in the living room, your calendar was on the wall, programs were literal objects you clicked, like toys. It looked friendly, it sounded revolutionary, and it failed almost instantly. Why? Because Bob solved a problem nobody actually had while creating several new ones. It was slow, confusing, and somehow harder to use than the system it was trying to simplify. Users didn't feel empowered, they felt talked down to. Within months, adoption collapsed, retailers stopped pushing it, Microsoft quietly moved on. And Bob became a punchline, the software equivalent of an embarrassing haircut phase. The lesson here is brutal. Hype can get people to install something once. But usefulness is what makes them stay. Microsoft Bob didn't crash. It didn't break computers. It just revealed a timeless truth. If your operating system feels like a gimmick, people will treat it like one. Palm OS Cobalt Palm OS Cobalt was supposed to be Palm's comeback story. By the early 2000s, Palm was in trouble. Smartphones were getting faster, more powerful, and more complex, and Palm OS was starting to feel old. So, Palm did what every struggling tech company does. They built a brand new operating system and hoped it would save them. Cobalt looked impressive on paper. True multitasking, better graphics, modern memory management. Basically, everything Palm OS users had been begging for. There was just one small, catastrophic issue. Nobody showed up. Developers didn't build apps for it. Hardware partners hesitated to commit. And Palm itself never fully pulled the trigger on real consumer devices. Cobalt lived in demos, conference presentations, and press releases, but not in stores. It was an operating system people talked about, not one they actually used. And that created a perfect loop of failure. No apps meant no users. No users meant no developers. And no momentum meant no future. Within a year, Palm quietly abandoned Cobalt and pivoted again, as if it had never existed. Palm OS Cobalt proves one brutal truth of computing. An operating system without an ecosystem isn't a platform. It's just a really ambitious idea that starved before it ever learned how to walk. HP WebOS WebOS was good. Like, actually good. It was fast, smooth, and intuitive in a way most operating systems weren't at the time. Gestures felt natural. Multitasking worked like magic. You could flick apps around like physical cards, and somehow, it just made sense. Reviewers loved it. Tech fans were excited. For a moment, WebOS felt like the future. Then HP got involved. HP bought Palm, inherited WebOS, launched a few devices, and immediately lost confidence. Sales were slower than expected, inventory piled up, internal panic set in. Instead of fixing the strategy, HP pulled the plug. Within months, HP cancelled all consumer hardware running WebOS. Not next year. Not after updates. Immediately. Developers watched this happen and walked away overnight. Why build apps for an OS with no devices? Users were left holding beautiful hardware with absolutely no future. WebOS didn't fail because it was confusing or unstable. It failed because the flaw disappeared beneath it. An operating system cannot survive on praise alone. It needs devices, momentum, and belief. WebOS became one of tech's greatest what-ifs. A reminder that even brilliant software dies when it loses the hardware war. IBM OS2 Warp OS2 Warp wasn't a scrappy underdog. It was built by IBM, the company that practically invented modern computing. And it wasn't supposed to compete with Windows. It was supposed to replace it. OS2 began as a joint project between IBM and Microsoft. But when that partnership exploded, Microsoft walked away and focused entirely on Windows. IBM doubled down. OS2 Warp was powerful. It was stable. It could multitask better than Windows. And, most importantly, it could run many Windows programs, sometimes better than Windows itself. On paper, this was game over. In reality, it was a nightmare. Hardware support was inconsistent. Drivers were hard to find. Software compatibility worked just enough to be dangerous, close, but never perfect. Users didn't know who to trust. Developers didn't know where to commit. And IBM moved slowly, while Microsoft moved everywhere. Within a short time, Windows became the default. OS2 Warp faded into corporate backrooms and ATMs, literally. IBM OS2 Warp didn't fail because it was weak. It failed because ecosystems beat engineering. 
Replacing Windows overnight wasn't a feature. It was a losing war, no matter how good the OS was. Android 3.0 Honeycomb Android Honeycomb existed for one reason, panic. In 2010, tablets were exploding in popularity. Apple's iPad had just arrived, and suddenly everyone wanted a big screen in their hands. Android, however, was not ready. So Google did what tech companies do under pressure, they rushed. Android 3.0 Honeycomb was built specifically for tablets, skipping phones entirely. It looked different. Menus floated, buttons moved, the interface tried to look futuristic, but under the surface, it felt unfinished. Apps weren't optimized because developers didn't know how. Performance was inconsistent because the system wasn't fully baked. Bugs appeared everywhere because Honeycomb was basically a public experiment. Users noticed immediately. Developers hated targeting it. Manufacturers struggled to make it feel stable. And Google knew it. Within a year, Honeycomb was quietly abandoned and absorbed into Android 4.0 as if it had never existed. No long-term support. No comeback story. Honeycomb didn't slowly fail. It was replaced before it could grow up. And it proved a painful rule of operating systems. Speed matters, but polish matters more. Because when an OS feels rushed, users feel like testers. And nobody wants their daily device to feel like a beta. Google Fuchsia Google Fuchsia is one of the strangest operating systems ever created. Not because it's bad, but because it's mysterious. From an engineering perspective, Fuchsia is impressive. It's fast, secure, modular, built completely from scratch instead of being patched together over decades like most operating systems. Engineers love it. They talk about it like a passion project. Regular users, however, had a different reaction. Confusion. When Fuchsia first appeared, nobody could explain what it was for. Was it replacing Android? Was it replacing Chrome OS? Was it meant for phones, laptops, smart displays, or all of them? Google didn't really say. There was no obvious pain it solved. Android already worked. Chrome OS already worked. And Fuchsia didn't make anything noticeably better for everyday users. So, excitement fizzled out. Development continued quietly behind the scenes, but public interest dropped fast. Not because Fuchsia failed, but because it never gave people a reason to care. And that's the trap. Innovation without context feels like noise. Potential without purpose feels irrelevant. Operating systems don't win by being impressive on paper. They win by fixing problems people actually feel. Until that happens, even the smartest OS in the room can feel invisible. Windows Phone 7 Windows Phone 7 launched with confidence that only Microsoft could project. The interface was bold. Tiles were alive. Animations were smooth. It didn't look like iOS or Android, and that was the point. For the first time in years, Microsoft felt different. Early reviews were cautiously optimistic. The OS was fast, clean, and surprisingly enjoyable to use. It wasn't perfect, but it felt like the beginning of something. Then, Microsoft panicked. Less than a year after launch, Microsoft announced Windows Phone 8, and here's the catch. Most Windows Phone 7 devices couldn't upgrade. Just like that, early adopters were stranded. Their phones worked, but had no future. Developers watched this happen and immediately pulled back. Why build apps for a platform that might reset itself every year? Why invest time in an ecosystem that eats its own users? Trust collapsed almost overnight. Windows Phone 7 didn't fail because it was buggy or slow. It failed because Microsoft broke the unspoken rule of operating systems. You don't abandon your believers. Once Microsoft moved on, carriers followed, developers followed, users followed. This OS didn't crash. It didn't burn out. It was quietly left behind. And in tech, that's the worst ending of all. Apple Newton OS Apple's Newton OS arrived with enormous ambition and absolutely terrible timing. In the early 1990s, Apple wanted to invent the future of personal computing. Not desktops, not laptops. Something smaller. Something you could hold, write on, and carry everywhere. That future was Newton. The OS introduced ideas that sounded insane at the time. A handheld computer, a touchscreen, a stylus, and handwriting recognition instead of a keyboard. The problem was, none of it was ready. The hardware was slow, bulky, and expensive. And the handwriting recognition became infamous for hilariously misreading even simple words. Late-night comedians loved it. Users did not. Within a few years, Apple killed the Newton platform entirely. But here's the twist. The ideas didn't fail. The timing did. Touch-first interfaces, 
mobile operating systems, stylus input. These concepts didn't disappear, they went dormant. Years later, Apple reintroduced them with better hardware, faster processors, and simpler design, and the world loved them. The Newton OS proves a brutal truth about operating systems. Being first doesn't mean winning. Being right too early can look exactly like failure. Some operating systems don't change the world directly. They wait and change it later, when the world is finally ready.